Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would call the meeting of the Policy Review Committee to order at this time. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone who's here today. Uh, the first uh, matter, um, uh, I see I have some, some language here. As the committee members will recall during our June 18th, 2018 meeting, we lost power due to a severe thunderstorm. Because of the power outage, the live video footage of the meeting was corrupted. Therefore, minutes, and uh, they were in your packet that was given to you, of the meeting have been prepared. The minutes of the June 18th, 2018 meeting are behind tab one in your binders. Um, are there any corrections to the minutes? Yes, Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Birch, and good afternoon. In reviewing the minutes on page three, item number six, there was a request by me that board members be provided with a copy of the student handbook. So is that? It is dated 2018 to 2019, and staff was on that uh, when I spoke with them earlier. Thank you very much. And also, um, at the bottom of that same paragraph six on page three, it says that there was a motion made by me, seconded by Mr. McDaniels, that was recommended the discipline policy be brought forward by superintendent staff at the September meeting, but no vote was taken. And I don't recall why that was. That may not hold a lot of weight, given that the full board voted to bring them forward in I think the, the term is, meeting. respectfully, I think the term is overtaken by events. Okay. So it does reflect what, what occurred. It just doesn't mean any action was taken, but it does re reflect what occurred, so. Okay, but so um, for planning purposes in, and I see that we have some um, comments in, uh, around the discipline policies, but they will be brought forward also on the October PRC agenda. Well, the question is whether the term brought forward is relevant. They'll appear on the agenda as uh, we had been requested okay. by, the, by the board members who had voted that it be done, and I would note that We've actually tried to go uh, a month early with information about it, given that it's um, a significant topic with a lot of information about it. Great, I appreciate that, thank you. I would then ask, are there any corrections or any additions or deletions or uh, otherwise subtractions to the minutes? If uh, there are no corrections, there being no corrections uh, to the minutes, the minutes are approved. Uh, now directing your attention to tab two, um, we have some guests with us today. Um, um, the Disability Rights Maryland and Public Justice Center um, will be here to address us with regard to uh, uh, our behavior uh, and or discipline policies. So please come up, welcome. Uh, I wish it was a sunny day, but we haven't had uh, the severe weather we had just um, at our last Policy Review Committee meeting. So please, please come up and um, as you see, we've set aside some time for you all to talk, and uh, then we have some time for board member questions as well. So please introduce yourself for the sure. record. Thank you. Um, so my name is Renuka Rege. Um, I'm an attorney at the Public Justice Center in our Education Stability Project. Um, and part of the work that that project does is um, representing individual students and families in suspension and expulsion matters, um, providing trainings to com community members about um, know your rights in suspensions and expulsions, and also uh, working to reform um, discipline policy at the state level and in individual counties to make sure that it's serving all of our students um, in the best way possible. Um, and now I'll let Megan introduce herself as well. Good afternoon, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Megan Berger, I'm an attorney with Disability Rights Maryland. Disability Rights Maryland is the designated protection and advocacy agency for the state of Maryland, and we're mandated to defend and protect the civil rights of individuals with disabilities, including students with disabilities who face school discipline matters. Um, over the last 40 years, Disability Rights Maryland has been a leader in the educational advocacy community and has represented individual students and families as well as engaged in systemic advocacy. Um, we were very involved with the 2014 passing of the discipline regulations as well as the recent pre-K to second grade suspension ban in July of 2018. Um, and we're here today because through our direct representation work, we have, um, we've seen that 
Baltimore County Public Schools policies, governing policies and procedures aren't in line with Comar state regulations, and we've seen the, the negative impacts that that has on our clients. So um, today we're going to highlight um, just a few of the ways um, that, we, uh, that we have seen and that we're concerned about um, how the policies don't align with Comar. Um, and so I just, just to give you a little bit of context um, about how we first got involved in this area um, is that uh, both of our organizations um, sent a letter uh, to Mr. Virch um, and uh, Mr. Gillis outlining um, different, the different ways in which um, the policies don't align with Comar. Um, and then he uh, responded to us um, saying, inviting us to testify today at this meeting um, on those concerns, um, and also sharing with us the most recent drafts of the policies, which were, I believe, developed um, in this re review process last year, but never actually went through. Um, so we took a look at those more recent versions, um, and they did address a couple of our concerns. Um, we sent another letter back, um, but um, the great majority of the concerns were not addressed. Um, and in addition, the new drafts presented a few more um, issues. And so today we're just going to touch on um, some of the most salient issues in the interests of time. Um, but but um, our letters are there, and we hope that you will take a look at them to see uh, more detail and, and a, a comprehensive list of the different ways that we believe that the policies need to be revised. Yes, so the first letter we sent was um, July 20th. Um, and then our response, we received a response back on August 3rd. And then we sent our reply on August 17th. Yeah, I would just for the board members, uh, I would let you know that uh, you have the um, uh, August 17th, which I think is a pretty salient letter. And uh, the other letter is certainly available. We can certainly make that available to, to folks. Um, in fact, the letter suggested uh, a meeting with myself and Mr. Gillis, but I thought it was in the board members' best interest uh, that um, we invite our guests to come today and speak directly with us to share their concerns directly and afford you the opportunity to ask questions. I also like the idea that we would live stream it and also create a video record of what was said and asked and answered. Sure, so please go ahead. Of course. So. So that's just um, a brief context, um, and so, oh, clicker. So how do I move to the next slide? Yeah. I'm sorry? It did? It went really quickly. Oh, there we go, okay. So here, there we go. So here's, here's an outline uh, of the issues that we're going to touch on today. So we're going to start out um, just by describing briefly uh, the harmful effects that exclusionary discipline, such as suspension and expulsion, has not only on the kids that experience it themselves, but on um, entire school climate as a whole. And then we'll get into uh, just a few of the substantive issues with the policies, um, the first being that the, the policies need to be revised to incorporate the new um, pre-K to second grade suspension ban legislation that passed in 2017. Um, the second is that the policies should be revised to include the specific requirements um, around discipline of students with disabilities. Um, third, we will talk about the issue of administrative transfers to alternative schools and um, the ways in which the policy as it's currently written violates uh, state regulations. Um, and then finally, we'll touch briefly on a few issues with the appeal and mitigation process. Um, and then um, we'll have time, of course, for questions from the committee. We wanted to first briefly touch on the harmful effects that exclusionary discipline practices have on students. As I'm sure the policy um, review members are aware, there is a whole body of research out there that um, addresses the, the varied negative impacts that suspensions and expulsions and other exclusionary discipline practices have on students. Um, and in July of 2012, the Maryland State Board of Education issued a report on school discipline that delineated the different negative impacts that harmful um, school discipline practices have on students. 
And so what we know from the research is that exclusionary, exclusionary practices result in school failure, disengagement from school, isolation from school, failing grades, repeating grades. It results in dropout. It, revolts, it results in involvement with the juvenile justice system and the criminal justice system, and it results in substance abuse. We have a quote, the American Psychological Association has found that suspension and expulsion practices harm academic achievement for all students while increasing the chances that those excluded will be held back, drop out, and become involved with the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And I think this quote is important because it highlights the fact that when a student is suspended or expelled, there's not only a negative impact on that specific student, but the whole school climate is affected and negative achievement, out, negative achievement outcomes on a school-wide level is, is connected with suspension and expulsion practices. Exclusionary discipline also disproportionately impacts children of color and children with disabilities. In Baltimore County Public Schools during the 2016 to 2017 school year, African American children made up 39% of the student population, but 66% of children suspended. Children with disabilities made up 13% of the student population, but 25% of the children suspended. So exclusionary discipline affects the individual child, it affects school climate, and it disproportionately impacts children of color and children with disabilities, which is something that local school systems are going to have to um, address and have corrective action plans to address disproportionality. Moving on to the first substantive issue that we wanted to bring to the committee's attention is the pre-K to second grade suspension ban. Policy in Rule 5560 must incorporate the new Maryland law prohibiting suspension and expulsion of pre-K through second grade students effective July of 2017. There are two limited exceptions to the suspension ban, and the first is that expulsion is permissible under the Federal Gun-Free Schools Act if a student brings a firearm to school. And the second is that suspension up to five days is permissible if school administration, in consultation with a school psychologist or other mental health professional, determines there is an imminent threat of serious harm to other students or staff that can't be eliminated or reduced through interventions and supports. So as of now, this is not, this isn't reflected in policy and Rule 5560. Um, and it, Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm gonna switch. Policy and Rule 5560 must incorporate the new law, but it also must address implementation of the law and clarify its requirements and process for BCPS staff and families. There are several implementation issues that local boards will have to address with respect to implementation of this new law. And we wanted to flag and highlight just a few of the implementation issues that we believe are most critical. The first is there must be a process and the policy must address a process for determining imminent threat of serious harm. Who is involved in that determination and how is that determination made? There also has to be a policy to ensure that the consultation with the mental health professional or the school psychologist is meaningful. There must be documentation of that required consultation determination. There must be notice to parents and there must, there must be the providing of a copy of the mental health provider's determination document. And finally, there must be an, an appeal process for a suspension of one to five days. So again, there are gonna be a host of implementation issues and these are the ones that we feel are most critical and should absolutely be addressed by this board when they incorporate and implement the new, the new law into policy. The second substantive issue we wanted to address is discipline policies for students with disabilities. 
Policy and Rule 5560 must incorporate federal and state law limitations on the discipline of students with disabilities under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Section 504. As currently written, the policy references federal and state law limitations under the IDEA. It does not mention Section 504 and it does not explain what the legal requirements are. It just simply references the IDEA. Um, there are several key legal requirements um, and protections for students with disabilities with respect to discipline policy. And a few of those that need to be reflected in board policy is the requirement of a manifestation meeting, a completion of a functional behavior assessment and behavioral intervention plan, and lastly, educational services for students who are on extended suspension or expulsion. Okay, so the next um, issue that we wanted to highlight today is this issue of um, administrative transfers to alternative programs um, and uh, the ways in which uh, the policy currently is now violates uh, Comar. So currently, when um, a principal makes a referral to the superintendent's designee to take a certain disciplinary, to determine the disciplinary action that should be taken, the policy and rule currently allow um, the designee to decide to transfer the student to an alternative program without making any particular sort of legal findings or um, you know, even without the consent of the student and the parent. Um, it just allows the designee to make that decision. But if you look at uh, Comar, it defines any removal of a student from their regular education program as um, an extended suspension or expulsion if it's for disciplinary reasons. And the extended suspension or expulsion depends on the length of the removal. So a, a transfer of a student out of their regular school into an alternative school is a removal of the student from their regular program. So um, it has to be treated the same way as an extended suspension or an expulsion under our state law. And it's not, it, it, it cannot be treated as a separate disciplinary response. Um, so because, because um, Comar requires, um, the Comar requires the CEO's designee to make certain legal findings before, or findings under a, a specific legal standard before they're allowed to make a decision to do an extended suspension or expulsion. So for an expulsion, the designee has to find that the student's return to school would pose an imminent threat of serious harm to other students or staff. And for an extended suspension, they either have to make a finding under that standard or they have to find that the student's behavior caused a chronic and extreme disruption. So um, therefore, Comar requires the designee to make those findings before transferring a student to an alternative school, depending on the length of that removal. But currently, the way that the policy is written, it doesn't require the designee to make those findings. Um, and so um, that allows the designee to transfer the student to one of these to an alternative school without making the, the, the legally required findings under Comar. And that's, um, that's an explanation of how the way um, transfers are currently carried out is in violation of our state regulations. Um, and um, just to you know, just to let you know, some of our experience with our clients themselves, um, transfers to alternative schools really have the same effect as an extended suspension or expulsion of um, excluding the student from their school. And um, in our experience, many times they're viewed the same way. Um, the the family feels that they were basically expelled, um, and so that goes to show that um, not only is this in the letter of the law, but it also has an effect in practice. And then the last set of issues that we wanted to touch on um, relate to the process of appealing an extended suspension or expulsion to the board um, and the parallel process of mitigation, um, which is an internal process within um, the school system. So there are a few different issues here and I'll just briefly highlight them and um, they are more, they're explained in more detail in our letters. But the first issue is that in the policy, um, 
the, the deadline for a family to appeal an extended suspension or expulsion to the board is 10 calendar days. Um, but in many of the notices that families are given about your appeal rights, it says that um, the timeline is 10 school days. And so there's some, there's a lack of conformity um, in, in what actually the timeline is. Um, and our recommendation is that in order to conform with all other relevant timelines in the discipline process, um, school days should be used. Um, and also that gives families time to prepare for an appeal. Um, the second issue is that many of the materials, um, such as the student handbook, the rule, um, some of these other notices that I mentioned, um, they say that the, an appeal of the length of a removal or the location of an alternative program are not issues that should be brought to a board appeal. They're issues that should be um, brought towards mitigation. But there's nothing in either Comar or even um, the, poli the board policy itself that limits the issues that a family can appeal regarding their suspension or expulsion. Um, the families have a right to appeal any part of that decision that the CEO's designee had, has made. Um, and so these issues can't be dele delegated solely to a mitigation process. And then finally, um, there is some confusion with the mitigation process itself. Um, like I said, the rule and some of the notices in the student handbook say that um, there's some confusion as to whether a family should request mitigation before they seek an appeal, so right after the designee has decided, or they need to exhaust the board appeal before they seek mitigation, so there's confusion around the timing. Um, and also, it, it, there's confusion as to whether requesting mitigation waives your right to a board appeal. Um, and we recommend that uh, a family's decision to pursue a mitigation process should not waive their right to appeal to the board, um, you know, should they need to further on. Um, and so while some of these issues that I just mentioned there um, in the rule or the, or the handbook or the notices, I think they're still relevant to the policy committee and the board because they deal directly with the, board, the appeal to the board, which is what a family might choose to do. Um, so those are the, the issues that we wanted to highlight today, and uh, we wanted to encourage you all to use this process of reviewing these discipline policies and make sure they're fair, equitable, and also consistent with um, governing law. Um, and we look forward to continuing to engage in this process of revising the policies. Um, and so now I, we have time for questions um, from you all. Well, very good. Thank you so much for your presentation, and I appreciate you moving it along. Just to, just to get one matter clarified, you used the language that expulsion is per permissible under the Federal Gun-Free Schools Act. Isn't it a fact that it's mandatory on the Federal Gun-Free Schools Act? Mandatory. It is, so under the Federal Gun-Free Schools Act, um, the superintendent on a case-by-case -case basis can uh, make an exception and decide not to expel a student. You would so, agree that the language of the act speaks for itself? Yeah, and that's okay. in the act. Okay, good. Um, I wanna thank you for the presentation that you made. I did wanna ask you about um, the letter that you had sent on the 24th. And with regard to the letter of the 24th, you had made reference to the timeline for appeal being un- I so which, yeah. which letter? I That's don't, letter didn't send of, one on the 24th. That, uh, April, or strike that, August 17th, that it was okay. unduly short. That's sort of the quote, that's the language that's taken from the letter. It's unduly short for an appeal process. And in your presentation today, uh, what you really were focusing on is um, the fact that there's 10 school days is what you would advocate as opposed to just 10 calendar days. And that's really a matter of whether we count the weekends in or not, pretty much. It could be a holiday, but that's really sort of what what the division, what the distinction is there, and you would prefer that whatever we use, that at least track in whichever source, whether it be in the rule or whether it be in the handbook. Yes. So the the timelines um, in all the timelines in all the documents should track each other, mm -hmm. um, and we would argue that school day should be used in order to give families sufficient time to gather the resources that they might need to in order to do an appeal. And would you and also, so that's huh? where the unduly sure. language would come in. Sure. And the term unduly is whatever you know, is in a context. So what I wanted to ask you about is, isn't there really sort of competing interests here? The longer a child is out of school, if we believe what you share with us, and I have no reason to doubt it, then there's a detrimental effect. But if we have lengthened times to prepare for an appeal hearing, then that may keep the child out of school 
longer. The child has, the decision has already been made to keep the child out of school. So the child is already going to be out of school for over 11 school days anyway, 11 to 44 days or 45 plus days for an expulsion. So extending the timeline, you know, two more days, that's, that's not going to affect the time that the student's going to be out of school. It might actually make it easier because they might actually be more likely to file an appeal and get the decision changed. So then it's really not an effect of harmful effect on the child then because you just said it's not that significant. Is that right? Two, two more business days is a significant amount of time for a student to be able to find, re um, excuse me, find resources. But what I'm saying is that um, it wouldn't affect the time that the student's going to be out of school because this, the decision has already been made of how long they're going to be out of school. Right, but two and it's more, always uh, less than 10 days. But what I hear you saying is that two more days out of school is not going to be significantly detrimental to the child. Is that your position? No, that's definitely not our position. Every okay. school day is important to the child. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, I did want to ask you with regard to the importance of narrowly tailored graduated responses mm -hmm. for different types of discipline offenses. Yes. Might you be able to share, and if this is not the right time, perhaps you could just follow up with us, could you share with us like, um, like an example of that in one of the three categories that we have of our offenses uh, in the student handbook? We actually have some there if you want, want to have one. You, of course, you're very familiar with it. So if you have an example that you could share with us, I think that might be useful for the, for the committee members. Um, I don't have an example because I don't, I don't have the handbook in front of me, but what, or, or the, well, it's right, right. There. But what we, did, what we did notice while we were going through it is that um, for, for many of the offenses, um, short-term suspension is permissible, long-term is permissible, extended is permissible. So there's you know, any number of responses that um, a principal may choose to recommend or the designee may choose to decide to take. It doesn't give um, families clarity initially what they may be facing if a certain behavior if if a certain behavior is committed well to the extent you're able to you know generate an example of what you think we could significantly improve upon feel free to share that with us uh, i know the committee members would would very much um, benefit from that now you in a prior communication had made reference to zero tolerance and that the state has has rejected zero tolerance. Zero tolerance to different folks may mean different things, but I wanted to find out from you what you might have been referring to when you say the state board has rejected zero tolerance. How did they define that? I th in, in, in the Maryland State Board of Education Discipline Report and in a, a lot of the, in the body of research, zero tolerance is sort of the, the one fits all approach. So a student, there's a violation of the student code of conduct and the administrator or the teacher, there's no discretion allowed. So when we talk about graduated or progressive responses to a behavior, um, and that's what's, that is what the, um, the model, the Maryland model um, code of student conduct embraces is the progressive model. Um, but the zero tolerance, the zero tolerance approach is that there's zero discretion. There's a certain violation and that child is based on the infraction suspended. Extenuating circumstances aren't, um, aren't evaluated to determine whether there's a lesser response or a response that could keep the child in school that would be more appropriate. Well, I, like, I, I understand please, please. that there may, you, there, one may perceive a tension between not wanting to have zero tolerance and wanting to have um, specific, narrowly tailored graduated responses as, um, as, as you know, we were talking about before, having more specificity, specificity as to what offenses may lead to what responses, but I think that it is possible to strike a balance um, and give families clarity as to what the responses might be while also avoiding zero tolerance and providing some discretion to um, principals and administrators. And I think that our state guidance um, provides an example of striking that balance. I, I see the, the importance of balance. What I just wanted to ask you is, is your position that if one was to adopt a zero tolerance position, that it would be illegal for a local school district to adopt a zero tolerance, or would it be offense specific? 
Um, it would be illegal to adopt zero tolerance because the regulations say that there must be discretion provided um, to administrators. And that's consistent with the position that the State Board has taken. Is that your position today? Which position? What you just said, that it would be illegal to have zero tolerance. That's in, in alignment with the State Board, is that right? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, um, I've had a few questions. Uh, Chuck, do you have any questions for our guests? Um, yes, I do have a question. I wanted to first thank you for your advocacy for some of our student groups that are in most, in, most need. I think this is a very good uh, discussion to start out with. I wanted to ask you um, specifically, you made some comments about uh, the requirement, I don't know if it's a state law regulation or COMAR, that corrective action must be undertaken by a system that has disproportionality in certain student groups. Right. And um, both at the local board and at the state board, um, there's been some public comment that has challenged that um, notion and implied that this could actually lead us down the wrong path. Um, they're putting school safety and the climate in the classroom as the highest priority. And wherever that leads us, some of the comments come there. But could you comment on the harm that's done by ignoring this disproportionality that we see and why we should, in fact, follow the state laws or regulations that exist? Um, so, I think uh, it is extremely important to um, continue to focus on disproportionality and to combat it um, because it would be a mistake to assume that whatever we're doing um, without keeping that in mind is uh, simply just objective and leading to the results uh, that are objective and you know and that's just the truth. It would, it would be a mistake to assume that the systems we have in place um, to administer discipline are objective without uh, examining them, um, keeping in mind the disproportional disproportionality that we see. And we need to keep that in mind in order to avoid discriminating um, against some of our m most vulnerable student groups. Um, not 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 necessarily intentionally discriminating, um, but having the having a disparate impact on our student groups. And as we know, the the research there is extensive research that has shown that um, disproportionalities in discipline also affect student achievement. And so, if we want to make sure that we're addressing achievement for some of our groups that may not. You know, we, we have been talking about achievement gap forever, and one of the significant contributors to that is because we're excluding certain students from the classroom rather than addressing their needs. Um, and, I, and I would say that that's one of the most important reasons that we need to continue to focus on disproportionality. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Um, yeah, I think that the, you know, Maryland State Board was very clear that school discipline and academic achievement, those two things go hand in hand. And in order to close the achievement gap and make sure that every student is career ready, college ready by the time they graduate, um, every student, we absolutely have to um, focus on the disparate impact and make sure that our students that are most in need are receiving the support and the services that they need and that we get into the, the root causes of why, why is the disparate impact happening. Um, and after figuring that out, addressing, addressing the causes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Um, thank you for your present. Thank you for your presentation. So my question is, when you um, follow the Maryland law with the exclusionary exclusionary discipline and the pre-K to second grade suspension ban, how exactly do you plan on? How exactly do you create an atmosphere where the students believe that okay, some me and somebody else just got in a fight? you're not going to suspend them, because that's the initial reaction. You're not going to suspend them, but they're still going to be able to come to school. How do you create that atmosphere where there's belief and trust that although that person is coming to school, things will get better? There will be a, a, a there will never be another reason why me and this person is in a fight. And then how do you also create that trust within the community that they believe that, okay, this um, discipline and this way that we're doing things is the right way to go and it will provide changes? How exactly do you create that atmosphere of belief? Right. 
Right, and, and that's a great question. Um, and I know that this is something that school systems, including Baltimore County, are, are looking at and trying to figure out. And one of the ways, um, the way that you phrased your question um, made me think of um, an, a different way of envisioning a school climate, um, and this is um, um, restorative practices. Um, and restorative practices is not, um, it's not only like, it's not only a replacement form of, like a replacement of a response to when something bad happens, but it's something that starts even before then. And it's, it's, it's really um, that there is a relationship of trust already among the students and among the teachers and among the administrators, so that when something bad inevitably does happen, like when two students do get into an argument and it results in a fight, um, there was there was a relationship there before, and now um, we need to repair that relationship. So restorative practices can actually work better to um, hold the, the student who acted out accountable for their actions, help them repair the harm that they did to others and to the, other, and to the community as a whole, and hopefully learn from that in order to do better in the future, rather than just simply kicking the student out for a couple of weeks and just like hoping that when they come back, things will be better. So that's just one alternative way um, to improve us, to create a better school climate and to deal with disciplinary incidents. I do, I, I also just wanna make sure that we, it's not, it's not our, um, our approach or our belief that suspension and expulsion never have a place in, in schools. Um, they are one of the continuum of options and they're the option of last resort, but there are absolutely going to be circumstances where that is appropriate, but in many cases, um, they can be avoided and the individual student will be, um, you know, their, their educational trajectory will be much more positively impacted. Um, but the alternatives, the alternatives to exclusionary discipline is what you're getting at. And it's a very important question. And um, that's where the positive behavior supports and interventions. And there's a whole array of alternatives. And some are, some are listed in the pre-K to second um, suspension statute. But I know that Baltimore County is, you know, is taking the lead in terms of some of their reorganiza reorganization and adding mental health um, workers and different aides into their infrastructure. And there are ways to sort of change change that school school climate and increase the level of trust um, and to repair relationships rather than excluding. David, do you have any questions? Kathleen? Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to thank you for your work on behalf of our student populations that need extra support in order to achieve their potential. Um, and I also wanted to ask if you would be able to share this presentation with the PRC, uh, also the full board, um, and also that July 20 letter. It seems like there's a lot uh, that would be in there that would help fill out this presentation? That is yes. the critical letter. So I, we do want to make sure that everybody has that letter. So we'll make sure. OK, thank you. And then um, on a short term, a, a short question that Mr. Virch was bringing up early, earlier in terms of the number of days, would it be perhaps helpful to consider business days, state business days, rather than calendar days or school days because if we have an expulsion that starts at the end of the school year the summer there's no school days but there are still appeals that can be happening mitigating so that that student could come to come to the school um, in September with the best uh, program available to them so I think business days also accounts for if there's holidays that limit the the time frame because what we want to set up is the most effective manner that the parents and families can work with the school system uh, to come to the best conclusion for that student and for the school community that the student is coming from. Um, so I would make that suggestion. The other thing is I, I do appreciate the other conversations that we've had, and I would just ask if um, there is a county in the state of Maryland that you have reviewed their policies and procedures um, that sticks out more clearly as one that clearly has uh, incorporated all of these recent changes. And if you might forward those suggestions to us, I'm not gonna ask you to 
you know, off the top of your head out loud, but that would be something that would be helpful rather than trying to reinvent the wheel if there's already some policies and procedures that have been in place. I think that would be helpful. If there, that's possible. there are certainly um, policies of other counties that have um, incorporated the specific requirements related to students with disabilities previously and also have um, taken the lead on incorporating the new legislation around pre-K to second grade. So we can certainly share those. Okay, that would be great. And then my next um, statement is, as a board member, it's disturbing to me that we have not addressed these issues sooner. Um, I was on the policy review committee when we discussed this back February of 2017 and there was a disagreement around taking out all of the categories from the policy, thereby making the policy very vague, and um, then all of those categories would be in the superintendent's rule, which could be adjusted and amended without formal, um, without formal approval by the Board of Education. So we did, as a PRC, decide that those needed to come back in and they needed to stay in. Um, and I th certainly think that that's something that you would agree with, that we need the parents and families to understand where these categories are and what the relative consequences would be with these particular types of categories of offenses. Um, that being said, I don't see in our policies or in your presentation today, the issue of identification of underlying issues. We've um, heard a lot about uh, folks that are in the, the justice system having struggles with reading and that many of them may in fact be undiagnosed dyslexia. Well, how frustrating is school gonna be day after day, year after year for a student that's struggling with an undiagnosed reading disability? Or uh, what if they have some other undiagnosed disability for which they really should have an IEP or a 504? So are there, um, are there, is there anything in Comar or from the state board that would suggest language around proper identification or if a student is involved in a consequence process, how can we make sure that they are being screened for some of these things that could help them achieve their academic potential, not saying that there wouldn't be a consequence or there wouldn't necessarily be a need for temporary alternative program, but just to really get to the root mm -hmm. of what is it that we may be able to help in the, our educational environment, in our educational programs to help that child have better behavior and achieve greater success. So is there anything there that you would recommend? There are, under the current um, COMAR regulations for discipline regulations for students with disabilities, um, there are provisions for students with a suspected disability. So if there is a um, behavioral incident that gets referred out and there's a suspension or, or an expulsion, um, the, the timeline and the manifestation, the protection of the manifestation meeting applies to um, a student who is suspected of having a disability. So there are, and in, in, um, in our July 20th letter in terms of students with disabilities, we did reference um, both Baltimore City and Montgomery County as jurisdictions that have comprehensive uh, board policies with respect to students with disabilities in both both under IDA and 504. And um, they also, I believe Baltimore City also has a separate policy for um, students suspected of having a disability. So there are protections, there are absolutely protections um, for those students and we can make sure that we get that information to the committee. Okay, and um, also you talk about research that uh, reflects the disadvantages that students uh, may go through by being excluded from school for a certain number of days or being referred to an alternative program. Where is the research or is there that discusses the impact on the classroom or the teacher if in fact the student that is misbehaving on a disrupting on a regular basis? Because we do, as you said, we have to strike a balance between um, a consequence that's not helpful to the student or to the classroom, but to consequences that are helpful. And we do have an obligation both to individual students, but we also have obligations to the classroom as a whole, to the school as a whole, and to that teacher in a classroom who may be experiencing disruption in her classroom. The, the, the research and um, the American Psychological Association is just one, one report that touches on this. So it addresses the fact that while it's intuitive to think that, um, 
for a child who's being disruptive. It's intuitive to think that if we remove that child who's being disruptive to his classmates out of the classroom, then the, the classmates that are sort of left behind, there will be a benefit towards them. Um, but the American Psychological Association's report points out that that there, there, is, they, there is not research suggesting that. And in fact, um, there's research suggesting that exclusionary discipline is often associated with less satisfactory ratings of school climate and school-wide negative achievement outcomes. So the, what, what, we, what we think of as intuitive, as um, exclusionary discipline, getting the student who's been disruptive out of the classroom, that that makes school safer and that it makes the environment better for those who are trying to study and listen in class, there, there is not research supporting that. And in fact, there's research supporting the opposite, that it negatively impacts school climate as a whole. And I see where you have references in your report that you've given to us. Yes. So when we get that through email or however, that would be helpful for us to review that, that sort of research. Sure. Um, and I will yield the floor at the moment. Thanks. Uh, the uh, July 20th letter has been emailed to all the, uh, the PRC members. So it's uh, there and it's handy and uh, you certainly, certainly can review it at your convenience. And we'd also like to see the PowerPoint uh, slides if we can. Yeah. yeah thank you for your generosity. I, I think I emailed the PowerPoint. Uh, well, I tried emailing it on Friday, but it bounced back. So I emailed it today. Um, so that should be in your email and, and hopefully can be shared with the committee as well. Certainly. We have it. We'll certainly make it available. In fact, uh, we can put it on, probably put it in with our uh, minutes mm -hmm. uh, so that anyone can see it. Um, of course, they can go and look at the, the live stream or whatever. Um, I want to thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, do any other board members have any questions while we have uh, our guests with us? Yes, Kathleen. Just one last thing that I have a question about that they might not have an answer for, but in terms of optimal process, mitigation is one process, appeal is another, but in terms of defining um, a path forward for the student or a consequence, what is or should the role of the teacher be that is, or whichever personnel is referring the student for a misbehavior in terms of deciding the outcome for the student? So um, one of the important parts of COMAR, as it is, um, is that in order to impose um, something that's more than 11 school days, an extended suspension or an expulsion, it actually takes that discretion away from the school level and puts it in the, um, on the district level and puts it in the, the superintendent's designee's hands. And um, the rationale is that um, if, if the school system thinks that it's necessary to take a student away from their education for that long, then that should be made by a more neutral party, um, someone who is outside of the school building and is able to make that decision on a more objective basis. So um, the, actually the teacher and the school level under the regulation should not have a role other than perhaps as a, a witness at a hear an appeal hearing. Um, of course, the school system can bring the teacher as a witness of what happened. Um, but they should not be having a decision-making role in that process. Okay, thank you for your comments. One last question for you. The, the narrow, narrow tailoring, and uh, we had sought an example, and if you're able, as I say, said earlier, if you're able to come up with an example, um, um, feel free to share it with us. Is that mandated by the State Board, or is that recommended by the State Board? So that approach um, is in the guidance, which is not law. So um, that is a, a recommended approach of, of how best to carry out discipline um, that's backed by the State Board's research. Um, and we can certainly go back to um, policy 5550 and the handbook which tracks that and um, come up with examples of ways that it could be improved. Where I'm going with this is to the extent then that something is recommended, isn't it a leap then to say that our system is not in compliance with what is recommended? Well, in the I mean, initial it's like, letter, like it's we, illegal or something. Well, in the initial letter, um, we, I mean, we've ident and also in the later letter, we've identified several areas, and I think in the initial one, we clarified that we have not, or maybe we didn't clarify this, but we we not only included. Um, several ways that it is out of compliance, but also ways that it could be improved in order to better serve all students. So 
just to finish off the point then, if something's recommended, it's possible that we may not align with that, but that doesn't mean that we're out of legal compliance because it's something that's recommended. By contrast, there may be things that are mandated by state law, by COMAR, that your position, and you've shared it I think very well today, that you believe our system is not in compliance with, legal compliance. Absolutely, there are, there's two different things, two different things that could be. <laughs> okay, well I wanna thank both of you, uh, Manisha and uh, Megan for coming I'm tonight. Renuka. Right, right, very good. I want to thank you both for coming tonight and speaking with us. And um, sometimes when you, you make an appearance, uh, there may be some other thoughts that you have afterwards. And if you'd like to share them with us, feel free to. Uh, we'll make it available to all the board members. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your time. Sure, please. And I would just let uh, my colleagues know that uh, we'll be forwarding copies of the July 2012 report of the State Board of Education with regard to school discipline and academic success related parts of Maryland's education reform. So you'll be getting that in your uh, emails as well. Uh, David, I want to thank you for being so patient. I know that uh, you all may not know this, but David has another meeting up on the Hill with regard to CTE, uh, a program that's just like really taken off in our system and is doing extraordinarily well. Um, going to item three on our um, agenda for tonight is uh, the review of public comments uh, received. So if you would go to tab three, you'll see the uh, comments that we've received with regard to uh, one policy that folks commented on during the uh, board meeting, and that was uh, policy 6307. Uh, five other policies, um, no public comment had been received. Uh, did any um, of our board members have any comments with regard to the public comments that were received with regard to policy 6307? Yes, Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Birch. I was just wondering if staff had any um, recommendations or response to the comments on uh, the public comments from policy 6307. If we could just, if we could just push the pause button for that moment. Um, there's really two parts to this. There's the, the policy itself that uh, speaks to patriotic exercises and it speaks to um, not coercing students to participate in uh, patriotic exercises. Uh, it, it sort of enshrines that. Uh, welcome back, David. Take it easy now. Yeah. Among some of the public comments um, involves a student who, during uh, an exercise, engaged in uh, a type of speech that could be characterized as symbolic speech. Um, but I would direct board members' attention to another existing policy, which is, um, uh, I believe it's policy 5600 about student um, responsibilities and rights. Um, and it's important to keep these two thoughts separate for purposes of discussion that students have their, their rights to free speech and rights of expression whenever they're in our schools. These are rights that, that stay with them and are not limited to any part of the day. They're not limited to that period of time during the morning exercises or when they're at lunch or at recess or in a class in the morning or the midday or in the afternoon or even in extracurricular or after school activities. Those rights remain with them and um, that, as I say, it's important to keep that separate and distinct from a uh, policy that relates to um, patriotic exercises. Anyway, with that said, go ahead. Uh, good, <clears throat> excuse me, good evening. So, um, Member Virch, I actually am of the same mind. Um, when I looked at policy um, 6307 and then looked at policy and rule 5600, it was seemed to me that 
any um, additional clarifying language should go in the overarching policy around students' responsibilities and rights, because that policy, um, as Mr. Virch lays out, talks about um, the board believing that all students have the right to free inquiry and expression, due process, equal education opportunity, and freedom from discrimination, that they may exercise those rights while respecting the rights of others. And then, among other things, the rule does cover uh, things like symbolic expression and patriotic exercises. And so those are just two of the things that happened with the incident at this, um, um, that involved this particular student and that are also covered under patriotic exercises. However, 5600 covers much more than just the opening exercises during the school day. Kathleen, do you have any questions? So I guess the, the question is, if policy 5600 is complete, then the incidents that were referenced were anomalies. They are outside of what we as a board feel is appropriate to preserve students' freedom of speech. Would you say that's a fair statement? I would say that, um, well, in being the person who actually gets the phone call when something like that happens, um, th there was one phone call I've received in the past 13 months around students exercising um, this particular type of free speech during opening exercises, although I know we have many students and many schools who have chosen to do so. Okay, so you're not recommending that we change our policy because of the public comment, because in policy 5600 we clearly cover that this board believes the students do have their right to free speech in, in a reasonable and non-disruptive fashion. I would say that, um, one, policy and Rule 5600 aren't up for review, so, um, and the board controls that schedule, so I would not um, be as so forward as to tell you to um, revise something that is not on the schedule. Um, however, I can see a point where um, people could not clearly see that students should not be punished for um, expressing themselves in ways that are not disruptive. At the same time, I believe that the more we can train administrators and staff on what disruption is, what students' rights and responsibilities are, we can see the overlap and intersection of those things without necessarily making an edit. However, if we were directed to review and consider those policies and rules, staff, you know, I may pull together a group of staff and they may recommend changes. Thank you. Um, one of the, um, the dangers I see is because speech can take such varied forms, especially symbolic speech. Um, I remember having a, a speech uh, instructor in college who commented that the most misunderstood communication is that which is nonverbal. Obviously, they never served on like a school board because sometimes what we say may not may not uh, be readily understood, but. The idea that something is symbolic, it can have many different meanings to many different folks. And it can also be time specific. So um, a, 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 a gesture with one's uh, uh, arm, for example, uh, in and of itself during a course of a day, that may be one thing uh, in terms of the nature of the speech. Um, it's still speech, and I think it's still free speech. But the, the action in a different, uh, different time during a different series of other events that are occurring, it may take on a different dimension. So I don't want any suggestion to be made that somehow um, the comments that we received suggested that somehow what a student did was not speech. I really believe that it is speech. But I, I, I think the best place for speech is over with, uh, with uh, the explanation of the rights uh, policy. Um, and I think it, it you know, I, I, I think the more, as you sort of you, you, you refer to the training, the more we share information with our staff about students and their speech and their expression, their right to expression, the better we're able to maneuver through a school day without disruptions, recognizing that even free speech that would fit under that category, there may be a degree of disruption inherent in the free ex speech or the free expression by a student. There you go. All right, well, thank you so much. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a comment uh, both by Ms. Causey and Dr. Adams uh, related to 5600. Not to jump ahead in the agenda, but one of the um, reasons that I'm supporting us going to a seven-year review of our policies rather than five years is to allow 
the Policy Review Committee to address issues that are pertinent as of the day. You know, we uh, sometimes bog ourselves down and with this administrative stuff that we have to do, we don't leave time to do things that are timely. Mm -hmm. So if 5,600, because of timeliness, needs to be reviewed, we shouldn't uh, uh, be limited by the fact that it's not up. I, I think that's why I think we need to design in more flexibility to, to discuss things like heat policy or the discipline policy when they become uh, topics of the day and not, I mean, we have a lot of policies and we, we're just limited sometimes, so I just wanted to throw that in. So if it needs revision, I think we should uh, find a way to do it. Well, thank you, Chuck. Um, I would just ask, are there any corrections, additions, or modification to the policy 6307 based on the comments received during the public uh, portion of our board meeting? Yes. So is the disconnect between the understanding of what is excused, like what does, so when I read here, any student or staff member who wishes to be excused, it's pretty ex self-explanatory to me. So is the disconnect between what the teachers deemed, like their belief of is this excusable participation of the um, program, is that is it based on what they believe in the classroom or what the student believes? Where is the disconnect between how this is getting implemented and whose level of moral belief? Um, so we're, of course, in a people business. And so I think with that, we all come to our daily jobs and experiences with our own perspectives and opinions on things. And one of the things that I know um, had to guide me when I was a school-based administrator was what does the law say? There were certainly things that students sometimes did that I did not like, um, but were not things that for which they could be disciplined or you know there were needed to be a different way. And so I could certainly, I don't wanna speak about this particular case or incident, but I could certainly see situations where um, staff who um, have a different belief about someone who might excuse themselves from the patriotic exercises might take exception to that and that those feelings might not be held secret from the students that are choosing to make that decision and that that may cause some kind of concern. Speaking very local and immediate, um, my son who's a graduate, um, we were, is about his junior year, um, and he, we were out shopping, and he asked me if I had seen Colin Kaepernick on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And I said, of course I have. I, you know, you know, he knows I watch his football. And he let me know that he wanted to choose to remain seated at his high school, and he wondered what would happen with him. And I told him that from my experience as a school-based administrator, as long as he sat quietly, nothing should happen to him. Um, and he, in fact, sat quietly for a while, and nothing happened with him and his homeroom teacher and all as well. And it is my belief that that is what happens 99 out of 100 times during the day because we know we have students who are keyed into these social issues and who are being our most vocal advocates of social justice nowadays, but we don't hear these instances where um, things go awry. However, I will also say in honor that one student had a negative experience is problematic and that we need to make sure that, that does not and um, does not become a systemic occurrence. I would just add that in both the policy and the rule, mention is made of uh, disseminating information to uh, students to inform students about their rights and also to our staff um, about students' rights of free speech and expression. And it has to be done periodically, and I suspect the system, um, uh, through the circulation of the updated uh, handbook, that kind of, that's sort of how the system is sort of meeting that need. Yes. Um, that may be worth, it may be in, in all of our interest for staff to revisit uh, whether uh, some retraining, some additional guidance is, is, would be helpful in that regard. But that's just, just my own thoughts. Any other comments? Yeah, Kathleen. So the last thing that I um, had was, there was a comment about JR, JROTC or other, programs where there is a requirement for respect for the flag, certain uh, behaviors during patriotic exercises, and that those uh, students are held to a different standard that they voluntarily accept. Mm -hmm. Would you say that that's a clear definition and so that we don't need anything else specific in here? I would. Thank you. Any, any, any other comments from board members? Uh, that being the case, um, 
Um, I would just uh, ask whether um, we could have a motion uh, to recommend uh, to the board adoption of policy 6307 uh, from the policy review committee. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Now, um, we do have several other policies uh, that no public comment was received on. The first one was uh, policy 6304, um, and that was uh, commemorations and observances. Uh, any um, comments from any board members with regard to policy 6304? Yes, Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask, on the list, I know that this organ this group the PRC had added Pearl Harbor Day for Mr. Ufelder's recommendation in an earlier committee meeting and I have heard recently from um, parents about uh, the different approaches to Patriots Day that we just had in September 11th and um, some were saying that there was no recognition of Patriots Day some say the classroom in the history or social studies did a segment on it appropriate for that grade level. So I'm just wondering, um, with some discussion, is that something that in the administration of the school system that there's a recommendation for Patriots Day? Or if the board, and starting with this committee, believes that that's appropriate to have as a um, guideline for, for the school system? I'm just wondering what we already have in place. Sure. Um, well, we certainly within the board within this policy has set out the fact that schools should devote a part of the day to the um, observances or commemorations listed here. For things outside of this policy, um, certainly things are added to the calendar and um, staff can often make those instructional decisions um, with discussion with the principal and or curriculum offices based on what's appropriate for students. Um, however, it is not always the case that we put out something systemic. However, if we know, for example, around something like Patriots Day that schools may inquire, we may then bring together, as we typically do, groups of teachers and administrators to help us make decisions about instructional adjustments, curricular resources that we can make available for them to use if they would so choose. But there's nothing in writing, for example, that would tell a school that they have to commemorate at the moment Patriots Day. Okay. Um, well, I would like to make a motion that we include Patriots Day in the list of um, days where there will be a commem commemoration and or observance exercise. Is there a second? Well, I'll second it. Any discussion? And if you'd like to second my second, you're welcome too. Okay. Yes, Kathleen. I would just like to say that given um, the recency of the event and the fact that it's helpful for our schools to have a consistent message and we in the education system are a way for students to receive real and objective information that it's helpful that it would be helpful for the school system to do that um, and when we are asking schools to do this we're not asking them to make it a whole day or make it a celebration or make it uh, a certain amount of time but that the school would make the decision especially given what the grade level is something that's appropriate but also educational. So I think it would be important to include it. Any other comments? Yes. What does other, other days of national significance refer to? So those would, at the moment, cover something like Patriots Day. So it would be another day that a, choo a school would choose to commemorate or observe that isn't explicitly listed. It's sort of like on our job descriptions, it says other duties as assigned. It's sort of a catch-all. Oh, wait, so it's already it's implied it's but it's not explicit it's not so explicit. it depends so if this board wishes for it to be implied or explicitly stated okay yeah, Chuck. I just wanted to comment I'm certainly not opposed to um, recognizing Patriots Day I think I'm just confused by a lot of these days on here like the first one I don't know why we do that but that's just me alignment with Comar Any further discussion? What is D-Day? 
Uh, D-Day is the 6th of June in 1944 when um, uh, one, two, three or more armies, a total of seven armies ultimately f uh, battled in Normandy uh, on the sort of north uh, coast of France. And it was, the, um, it was an invasion uh, to launch a second front in Europe um, against um, the Germans. And um, there was a, a very uh, noteworthy, many Marylanders fought in the battle. And um, uh, one of the um, five beaches, uh, Omaha Beach, uh, a Maryland uh, unit, uh, was one of the first to land and uh, took uh, um, just significant casualties, uh, not to suggest there weren't uh, significant casualties elsewhere, uh, but um, it's a, it, was a, it was a very, um, very, very bad uh, day, lot of loss of life, and it, some say it's the climactic battle um, because there is now a two front uh, going on in the war. It um, uh, leads to the conclusion ultimately of the war. But it's a fair question to ask, and generations going forward will ask that question, and one of the reasons they will ask that question is because in board policies for boards of education, um, that day may be listed as a day for a commemorative exercise in the classroom so that we do not forget the, uh, the lives that were lost, the sacrifices that were made by those who participated in that battle, those Americans, um, but there were others who fought in Normandy on that day and for the rest of that campaign. Uh, any further uh, discussions? If not, uh, is there a motion to adopt the, uh, the amendment? I think it may already have been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Right. I'm voting aye. Um, so the vote is three to one for the motion. Now on the, uh, the recommendation of the policy for uh, third reader to the full board. Um, uh, all in favor, um, is there a motion to recommend it in favor, favorably to the full board? So moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. There we go. <laughs> all right. Uh, now let's go to the, uh, the next policy that uh, uh, we have, and that's policy 6500 with regard to uh, research and assessment. Um, um, is there any discussion on this um, on this policy? Any corrections, any additions, any modifications to the policy? Based on the comments, since there weren't any received, that doesn't mean that you may not have any. Yes, Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Virch. I had a question. There is only page one, so it's in paragraph 1B. <laughs> And it says that the board recognizes its responsibility to develop and implement system-wide assessment tools and practices that align with college and career readiness, and that establish an assessment program that includes state-mandated, system-selected, and curriculum-embedded tests. So I just wanted a little explanation around curriculum-embedded tests, please. Good evening. Uh, curriculum-embedded tests are as described. They're assessments that are embedded within the developed curriculum um, that's provided by CNI. If you could just give a couple examples, one or two, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, so the curriculum tends to be provided in units, and at the conclusion of the unit, there tends to be an assessment that's developed reflective of the content in that unit. Thank you. Thank you for that. And then the other question I had is um, I had received questions around how there's no specific um, comment in here around special needs students or those with IEPs or 504s, and I'm just wondering if that's covered in the rule or is it so global that it's not necessary to have that? So the policy as written uh, would have implications for all students, including those who receive special services. Um, there's nothing in the policy as it's written that would preclude attending to the needs of students who are on IEPs or the needs of second language learners. Okay, thank you. Any further comment? 
Um, any, um, is there, may I have a motion with regard to uh, the disposition of this policy? Move to move forward with the policy. Uh, and would that be for third reader, reader, for third reader to the full board? To the full board. Um, uh, is there a second? Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? The policy will be uh, moved forward for third reader as presented. With regard to policy um, 7240, are there any corrections, additions, or modifications to policy 7240 based on the comments received? And there were no comments received. Well, may I have a motion with regard to policy 7240? Yes, Kathleen. Excuse me, Mr. Virch, but I was just reading the information that was uh, presented to us. The um, comment from a community member about new construction and talking about sensory rooms for students with occupational therapy needs <coughs> and perhaps different spaces related to if it was a community school or a Title I <coughs> school. Um, and if the staff feels that there was, if that's, if those sorts of situations are covered in the rule because the policy is very simple. Good evening. Good evening. If I understand your question right, that some of the specialized spaces that were mentioned during the comments, and the answer is yes, they are covered under the rule. The rule, when it, 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 the, when it says that we have to comply with the state regulation, the state regulation require preparation of a educational specification. Educational specification is prepared with the input from curriculum instruction, uh, strategic planning, and just about every department that you can think of. It is reviewed, and at that time, all of these spaces that are required that are incorporated in the educational spec. Educational spec is approved by the superintendent, and is approved by a state. And that forms the basis for the scope of work for the architectural team. So if any space is required, it will be part of the ed spec. And it's my understanding also that the principals are typically included. That's true. So that that particular school's program of education or specialties or community needs are then considered and included. That's correct. We, okay. we try to incorporate as many folks as we can including teachers in some cases and community members. Okay, thank you very much. Any further comments or um, uh, questions with regard to uh, policy 7240? Is there a motion uh, with regard to this position of policy 7240? I move that uh, policy 7240 be moved to the full board for third reader. As presented? As presented. Thank you so much. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, policy 7240 will be moved forward for third reader as presented. Um, with regard to policy 7310, are there any corrections, additions, or modifications to policy 7310 uh, based on um, any comments received? And as we indicated uh, previously, uh, we haven't received any comments. But if there are any comments, please um, feel free to uh, reference them. Or if any board members have any questions, please uh, use this opportunity now to, to ask them. Yes, Kathleen. Um, given the updated information we received via email, I believe it was on Friday, and then we received in print at our seats, there were two comments on policy 7310 uh, related to renovation projects, taking into consideration Title I students um, and other community needs. I'm paraphrasing here in the interest of time. And then also, um, in terms of evaluating the cost of building a new school versus renovating the school compared to the school's expected life cycle. Um, also in terms of retrofitting old buildings with air conditioning and some classrooms being hot and cold in terms of trying to 
retrofit a system into a school that was not designed for it and not having the optimal distribution of, of heating and cooling. Um, and there was also an additional comments around 10 years facility plan, but the board has already made a motion at our last meeting to uh, direct the superintendent to start working on uh, that process, how the school system and the county can work together on that process. So we are making progress in that regard. Um, so I would just ask uh, staff if in 7310, it's my understanding that when we go to the state for funding that it is required that we do the necessary feasibility studies. If you would speak to the timeline of when those studies are done uh, compared to when the projects come forward to the board for consideration. <coughs> feasibility study is required for those projects that uh, we are trying to replace uh, the building, but if we submit our project as a renovation project, then feasibility study is not required. In, in most of the cases, it is mo more cost effective uh, if the enrollments are at the similar level and no addition is required. Uh, it is cost effective to do renovation. If there are additions required or change in enrollment or drastic change in programs, I mean very drastic change, then feasibility study most of the time indicates uh, replacement of the school. So we have that experience, we know that, and we are familiar with this state's requirement. So once, once we submit a school for replacement, then we plan for a feasibility study during the design development stage, and state's architect it works with us in asking questions and raising issues. And so it is not a closed process, it's an open process. And if the results are that is more cost effective to renovate the school, then that's what we do. If we don't do that, then the state may not participate at all or not to the full extent. Okay, and what, it, just in general, what is the cost and timeline of doing a feasibility study it in that regard? It differs from project to project, it, uh, so it's difficult to pinpoint a number, but in several hundred thousand dollars, and it takes anywhere from six to 12 weeks. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to uh, recommend the um, policy before us uh, for, uh, to move forward to third reader for the full board? So moved. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Any further discussion? Yes, Kathleen. I'm going to be voting no on this, and it's going to come out to the full uh, board, which is fine. Uh, I just think I'm going to work on um, perhaps some language around doing that feasibility study of renovation versus replacement earlier in the process, because we have just been through the experience of having not just one, but two design and planning processes around Lansdowne High School, which was then ultimately rejected by the board. And now we're going to go through that feasibility study, which uh, might have been much more helpful and cost effective, uh, not only in the hard dollars that were already spent on planning and design that we're not using, but also in terms of the days and the months and the years that uh, that community may have to wait for the proper solution, um, given that we that there's now been a change and we have to go through this fe feasibility process. So I'll be voting no, but I will be bringing um, to the full board uh, my suggestion at a later date. Uh, any further discussion on the policy? Uh, any uh, any f no further discussion having uh, been heard? All in favor of recommending uh, or improving the motion as uh, made, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. So noted. Uh, this policy will uh, be um, brought forward to the full board uh, for third reader. Now, directing your attention to uh, the next item on the agenda, policy 8130. Uh, this reads uh, internal board policies organization policy formulation. Um, I was not here when the policy review committee originally took action on this. This has gone to the to the full board. The full board had it come back. Uh, there was a suggestion that uh, this be looked at uh, during the uh, board retreat. There was no retreat this year. Okay. And in reviewing the uh, proposed revised policy, uh, some items uh, caught my eye. 
uh, directing board members' attention to the first page of the policy with regard to line 38. As one reads over uh, at the beginning of that section, guidelines and statements of goals adopted by the board, policies assign authority, outline principles to, re to be followed with respect to, and the word says specific matters. And the word specific caught my eye because uh, we have a, an item today that is very specific, but it doesn't really involve guidelines or outlining principles, and that's the uh, uh, payment of $7,500 to the next board members. So that doesn't strike me as being like a principle kind of thing. Uh, there may be a principle that results if we follow it, but it doesn't really outline a principle. It says we're going to pay folks 7500 bucks. So um, I move that we change the word specific to certain matters, because I think for certain matters, it's important to outline um, policies. Uh, is there a second to the motion? Mr. Birch, uh, could you just tell me exactly where in the policy, what line you're uh, suggesting yeah. the word change? If you go to, the, go to line 38 on page one, uh, you'll see the word, uh, the third word from the right is specific. And members of the board, um, a copy with Mr. Virch's suggested changes is behind the yellow sheet. I'll second that uh, motion. Um, I um, explain why I think we should replace the word uh, specific with the word certain. Um, does anyone have any other uh, comments with regard to replacing the word certain, uh, strike that, the word specific with the word certain? Uh, all in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Any aye. opposed, no? Okay, that's the first one. Uh, directing um, the board's attention to uh, pay, or board members' attention to page three, and I would ask that you go to line 12. Um, line 12, page three, policy 8130. You'll see two, you'll see uh, the B is in brackets, that means it'll be removed. And the sentence, the line reads, the policy analysis will be presented to the board when? And then there's nothing else there. <laughs> so uh, what I had suggested uh, be the, uh, the language that we use uh, in this uh, second place, and you'll see it uh, in here, that in fact that that um, um, line read, the policy analysis will be, and it reads, made available to the public whenever the policy proposal is scheduled on either a board meeting or a policy review committee meeting agenda. And that's what I move to be the change for that because it's an incomplete sentence. It just ends on the word when. And I don't see any harm in uh, making uh, the policy available to the public whenever the policy proposal is scheduled on either a board meeting or a policy review committee meeting agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If members want to take a moment to look that over, you're certainly welcome to. Mr. Virch, if yes. you could just repeat your motion, please. Sure. Um, I move that uh, with regard to policy 8130, uh, on page three in line 13, that the proposed revised policy be amended to read, the policy analysis will be made available to the public whenever the policy proposal is scheduled on either a board meeting or a policy review committee meeting agenda. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, there being none, all in favor say aye and raise your hand. Any opposed? Nay, that then passes. Uh, with regard to um, another amendment, uh, that is with regard to first reading. And reasonable minds can disagree with uh, this, um, this proposed motion. But uh, when I, I shouldn't use the term proposed motion, I should say motion. And I move that uh, we amend policy 8130 with regard to um, line one on page four. So you go to the top of the page, that's where line one is, and it speaks to first reading. What's written in red is what I have proposed. So the motion reads, I propose that we amend policy 8130 in line, beginning in line one on page four to read, 
First reading, the policy proposal is presented as a report from the Policy Review Committee. And that would strike out what the, the Policy Review Committee, when I was not here, which is okay, uh, changed to have uh, first reading be an opportunity for the public to first comment uh, as well as other board members. Here you go up to the top. Okay. And um, is there a, a second to the motion? I, I will kind of explain it. Is there a second for the motion? Sure. Oh, so you just wanted to clarify that first reading was just for a presented report. Well, first I need to have a second so I can kind of answer you because oh. otherwise in the absence of a second, I'm pretending as though we had a motion on the floor. I've made the motion. The question is, can we have a second? Did I still get my answer question? Yes. Yes, second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so as I understand your question, is it to clarify, um, I have to answer um, uh, directly that it would actually change when it had previously been approved. Mm. There is the current process right now where first reader is when the policy proposal is presented as a report to the policy committee. That's what exists, or strike that, to the full board at a board meeting. That's what exists currently. And that item appears on the board's agenda the week before when the board's agenda is released, meaning made public. Now, we have a host of stakeholder groups, um, a number of which meet on a monthly basis. And that one week time frame may not be sufficient time for those stakeholders in these stakeholder groups to meet and discuss as to what position they wish to take on a policy proposal. Under the current uh, process, once the uh, policy is read on first reader, the stakeholder groups now have a month to have their meeting, to talk among themselves, to decide uh, what position they would like to take in favor of or against or change it uh, up in some way with amendments or whatnot. And it actually affords them time to make comments as opposed to rushing it within a week to make, a, to make comment on a policy proposal that they may not have been familiar with when it was before our policy review committee because they do have lives and they're busy with other things. Um, and that then would allow them a full month to come to prepare their comments, come before us at second reader, and as one looks below on line eight, it would read, second reading, the public shall have the opportunity to comment on the policy proposal. Now, I haven't included that yet in the motion, uh, but that's what the intent is here so that the public has a full opportunity to explore what position uh, members of the public or related groups would like to take, as opposed to, as, as I view it, being rushed to uh, come up with a position uh, when, in fact, um, that could then evolve later um, based on what further review might bring them among their members. Any other comments? Yes, Kathleen. Chuck, go ahead. Okay. Um, in practice, one of the confusions that has arisen is among board members. When we um, bring policies forward for first reading, whether that's the time board members should offer comments. And one of the things that's being deleted is that the public and board members shall have the opportunity to comment. And um, I just, I guess I have two thoughts. I wanted to solicit board member comments as early in the process as they're available to make them and also clarify at what point in the process we want board members to make comments because sometimes they're offered at the first reading and we say well that's not the right time <coughs> we don't think it's the second reader but and we don't want to wait till third reader to get that so i just want as a part of the policy to make it clear when we want board members to give their thoughts. I think it's an excellent point that you raise, and here's a th here is um, 
a follow-up. To the extent that board members may not have been familiar with what the public would like, when we have public comment, board members are now hearing directly from the public who's had an opportunity, assuming this motion passes, to study the proposal for a month after it's come out of the Policy Review Committee. That then uh, means that the public comment received is not only heard by board members, all of us, but also by Policy Review Committee members who then bring those comments back as we did this evening with the list of policies that we just went through one by one, and we can then incorporate the public suggestion into suggestions into uh, any changes for those policies. I would also add that uh, board members at any time, whether they're a member of the committee, the policy review committee or not, can send emails to uh, members of the policy review committee. Uh, the last part of it is something that I guess will ultimately have to be left to the next board, um, and that's not an unusual thing in that we've been in the education system since 1850, although sometimes we shake our heads as to whether we've moved beyond that century, I suspect. But those folks can then decide what is the role of the uh, committee system in how the board operates as a whole. Because if the board is going to act as a committee of the whole with board member comments and the like, then one could argue the board's time is finite and that obviates the need for having a policy committee because the board could then just act as its own committee of the whole and do whatever it wants to do. So that takes you from the small to the, the much larger, but um, I think it's, that's something for the next uh, board to evolve. Uh, certainly, my desire is not to uh, diminish the role of the policy review committee. I think that the committee is the place to do you know, all this hashing out. Um, I know that there are going to be board members who do want to make a public statement about a particular policy, and I don't think the way the policy is written now, it makes it clear when in the process we want that to happen. Mm -hmm. Do we want to make it at the first? I mean, I just think that that would be helpful in the organization of our full board meetings. To the extent that votes come on third reader, and that's when it's subject to a motion and discussion, if you think that needs to be clarified, that that is when board members comment during third reader, so that it's out there for everyone to see, I mean, I certainly could go along with amending it for, because people are gonna talk right now on third reader anyway, whether it's written in the policy or not. Mm -hmm. and, and I would go along with that, except that um, for the policy review committee to incorporate their thoughts, we certainly don't want them to wait till the third reader to share those thoughts, but I just know, again, you know where I'm trying to go. We're just trying to bring clarity as to when, mm -hmm. when, they want, when they want to speak, when they should speak up about a policy. Let me ask you this question. Um, do you, I mean, when we bring the, if we were to go with um, the proposed modifications that I'm suggesting, um, the, God bless you, the chair of the Policy Review Committee could certainly say uh, to the, to, as a friendly reminder to our board members who are very busy, but as a friendly reminder, that at any point they can, they can forward uh, their, they can email their concerns to uh, members of our Policy Review Committee um, because we are reviewing public comments and we are taking votes on uh, whether we're going to change anything with regard to a policy based on those public comments in a follow-up policy review committee meeting. Yes? What if to compromise, we meet in the middle <laughs> and we just put a comma, well, we first indicate whether first reader, second reader, or third reader, then we put a comma if it's first reader where the board shall have the opportunity to comment on the policy proposal. That way, it's easier. You can't say it's not in writing, that you have the ability to do this. And even if they forget, what, what if another meeting they forget what you have said? It's in writing, so they can always reference writing and documentation. Um, if you, well, first we have this motion now that, that, that I've made, and we've had some discussion. Kathleen, do you have any more? Go ahead, feel free. 
Thank you. Just to join in the discussion um, and to dovetail with all three of you is I, I believe that it would be consistent and helpful to have all the commentary at the same meeting. And I also think it would be helpful to have um, after the public makes their comments at the second reading and board members have an opportunity to make comments, but also to ask questions of staff, because sometimes when we hear from our stakeholders, whether it's individuals or we have key stakeholders that come, uh, some of our um, um, uh, master agreement groups come and they have commentary, um, as well as our advisory councils, that it would be helpful at that time to have board member comments, questions to the staff, and then all of that is brought back to the PRC after the, so between the second reading and the third reading, so that if board members wanted to say, well, I, w I wanna make this specific motion or this word or that word at the second reading, that would give the policy review committee time to do all of that work at the same time with the public comment, the board comment, and then any follow-up that might be necessary from staff. So I would uh, suggest that either Mr. Virch um, pull back his um, amendment or, or his motion for an amendment to this policy um, and that we make one that addresses both of your um, chair edits here in red where we're taking comments away from first reading, we're adding them to second reading, but we're also making it board member and then an opportunity for uh, questions from to staff. So I, I, that's not a motion, that's a, a question for discussion in terms of how we would move forward with what I think we're, is consensus building here. Go ahead, Chuck. You know, I, I like that idea. The only, I like the timing of what you're suggesting. I just don't want to put board members in a position where they would ever challenge a comment that's made in public comment. If they, if they have a comment that disagrees, you know, because we want to encourage people to come and make comments. We don't want to get in a, ch that's, a that's the only thing that came to mind. But I like the timing because then, again, PRC gets to hear public and board member comments before we present it for third reader. So I just don't want to get us. I see what you're saying, saying. about the, the back Kathleen, and forth. Kathleen, do you have a point you'd like to make? Go very good, go ahead. <laughs> I hear what you're saying about any potential back and forth or a stakeholder feeling that their comments were heard and then rejected or, or so forth. But I also feel as having in my past experience as a parent at a board meeting uh, giving comment that it would be more open and transparent if the public knew what any response was and then maybe there is follow-up questions and so there's not, so the point of the second reader and the comment is not to come necessarily to conclusions, right. but to hear perspectives, maybe there's some questions and follow-up we need to come back to PRC and folks knowing then what's gonna be discussed at PRC and they would have another opportunity to say, you didn't understand what I was saying or, um, along those lines to reiterate their concerns or suggestions. But to have it all at the same time, I think is more functional. Well, first there's a motion right now that would uh, amend um, page four um, within lines one through uh, four to read that the policy proposal is presented as a report from the policy review committee and that would be for first reading. Uh, that's not inconsistent with what uh, y'all have discussed mm -hmm. uh, now. So in taking these baby steps, um, any further comment with regard to the first reading and the change um, uh, proposed in the motion? I think it would, I think it would be more helpful to do it all at once, especially as I'm looking that in line five, six, and seven, they don't, they don't dovetail with what you're deleting in lines three and four. Well, in fact, um, the policy review committee will have the opportunity to review comments from the public and other board members because the comments may be in a medium that isn't made at a board meeting. If what you're saying is uh, we, can, we should delete the, the, next three, the, the next sentence, that's, uh, that certainly would be consistent 
with the, for, the, the policy proposal being presented as a report from the Policy Review Committee for first reader. We can certainly do that. No, I see what you're saying, that it's just comments as they come in any form, whether it's... Yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right. So then, on the motion to um, amend lines one through four to read, two, first reading, the policy proposal was presented as a report from the Policy Review Committee and striking uh, what is uh, shown as struck in red. Um, all in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, so that uh, modification uh, is approved. Now, with regard to the second reading, uh, the Chuck raised, I thought, a very, very good point because he said if we have, if we have the public making comments and then we have board members who are also making comments, his concern was that it might have a um, negative effect on members of the public who would like to speak if they believe that a board member may then take exception to what they have just spoken about. Uh, go ahead. So we could have the board member speak first, and then the public speak. Um, I hear no. you. I mean, what I'm thinking but is, then, you, but then, yeah, yeah, exactly. It obviates yeah, the need yeah. to then have uh, <laughs> Never mind. because you have one party commenting. Yeah. Uh, the other piece to it is then, if the board is going to do this with public comment, then why send the policy after second reader back to the policy review committee, which, from your own experience, the policy review committee is just is now rehashing what the board has already taken action as a committee of the whole to do. So it could just, because if the board has taken action, said what it wants, and uh, adopts something at second reader, then it just goes on to third reader and you have a nice day. I don't think we, I wasn't envisioning that we would take action, but mm -hmm. just expressing some public comment about policy. There are board members that feel strongly about some policy could be this whatever and they want a an opportunity in the process to publicly state what their position is not not to make a motion but just to state what they want PRC to consider this is what I was uh, so as I as, all right, as I hear what you're saying is then under second reader the the public would have the con would have the opportunity to comment as they currently have yes um, board members would not be taking action, Correct. but a board member who wanted to make a comment uh, would be able to with second reading. That's kind of, yes, yes. Um, and let me ask you this question. Are we talking single comments? Are we talking interaction among board members with regard to the policy? How extensive might it be? Single comment. Single comments. Or just like a public comment, you know, just like a statement. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I will make the motion for the language that I have here, and then I'll, I'll throw it open so that we have a basis for going forward. Um, I move that with regard to lines 8 and 9, where it reads, second reading, it says the public shall have the opportunity to comment on the policy proposal. Is there a second for that portion to permit public comment on second reading? Um, it, well, we would actually be adding the public having the opportunity to comment on on the policy proposal at second reading. We do that now, so this really doesn't. This wouldn't change that. It would change what had been proposed from a previous policy review committee meeting, but which for a policy which wasn't adopted by the full board. And then the amendment. Sure. Oh, okay. Second. Second. Okay. So um, the way it reads is that it would restore the public having the opportunity to comment on public uh, on this policy proposal in second reading. The language that's, that this is being added to reads, a policy proposal is presented as a report from the Policy Review Committee. So then the question is whether at second reader, as I hear Chuck and, and others say, is whether this should also be an opportunity for board members to comment. I'm inclined I mean, I, I, I believe in full discussion, but I don't see the reason then to have, a, to have the policy proposal come back to the policy review committee if in fact we're going to have the board 
acting as though it is one foot in a committee camp and one foot in its board camp. And that's the reluctance I have. If we're going to have a committee system, then let's use the committee system. If we're not going to have a committee system and we're going to have a semi-board acting as a committee of the whole, then we'd have a semi-board acting as committee of the whole with limited amount of time during board meetings to conduct all the other action. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking one night we had how many contracts? Mm -hmm. And the trend, and I certainly, again, respect uh, colleagues who would like to discuss contracts, but we've been, in some of our board meetings, we've discussed contracts for the bulk of the meeting, which doesn't necessarily leave us much time for a full exploration of a policy proposal that we're now asking board member comments on in second reader, which we don't do currently. So that's my position on it. Yes, Kathleen. Thank you. My position is that clarity is better than ambiguity and that as Mr. McDaniels has outlined, there has been a, a source of confusion um, and really just not efficient process around this very, very important work of policy work. So I would um, vote to amend your motion that the public shall have the opportunity to comment on the policy proposal. This is on line eight and nine after where it says second reading. And board members shall also have the opportunity to comment on the policy proposal for three minutes or less and ask questions of staff to be clarified in the weekly update. Is there a second? I'll second to have discussion. Sure, go ahead, Kathleen. So to speak to my amendment to your motion, is that way in the interest of running an efficient meeting in time that if board members have comments or questions for staff, that we won't necessarily uh, get involved in a very long-ended and open-ended agenda item, but that we would have an avenue where board members know that is their time to come forward with their comments and or questions, and then we have clarified for the administration that we would like those answers uh, at, in a weekly update, and then all of that would come back at a time when the PRC could um, address those issues. Whether a board member's comment includes, I, I want to make a motion to change this word or include that word. When we hear that at second reader, then that gives us the opportunity in the PRC meeting that intervenes between second and third reader to come forward with a recommendation and thereby making the next meeting where policies come forward for third reader uh, to be more efficient. So. That's my motion and that's my reasoning for it. So I, I would hope that we would support that. Uh, any other comments? Chuck? Um, I support the timing issue. I have um, the same concern about Mr. Virch that maybe we could include, I don't want to diminish the importance of PRC. I think we want to hash out things in committee as opposed to the full meeting. If we could use some kind of words about board members making comments for consideration by PRC, something to that effect, that they wouldn't be, you know, making, I didn't envision making, I, I thought the comments were for, for our consideration. I think that's a, a very good point, and I think we could just add another sentence that says, second reader is not a time for board action. Mm -hmm. Well, if I might, I would just observe that with 12 members of the board, um, at three minutes a person, um, because what someone is articulating, someone may have a question about so that they understand best, at, at three minutes a, a board member, that then leaves, that's 36 minutes. Um, we have, uh, in the interest of the board's which at times seems excruciatingly limited amount of available time, um, we have been limiting the number of policies to about four or five. If one takes the lesser number um, of four policies, that would be an additional two hours potentially added to every second reader. 
Um, if we do five, then of course it's even longer than two hours. And we get back to the fundamental question then, which is, do you have a policy review committee? If you have it, does it do anything? Or if you believe the best way to proceed is through the board acting as a committee of the whole, then perhaps you need to schedule additional board meetings during a month. And I see that our student member had a question. When voting occurs during the third reader, is there um, room for discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, ans the answer is yes. If there's room for discussion, why not just allow for comments one minute or less in a sense that in a following meeting there will be discussion about it? So you allow for somebody to comment, a board member to comment, but you do not allow for the discussion to occur. So which one? Oh, second versus third. Mm -hmm. Why not amend third to allow for the discussion so that way you're not spending 36 extra minutes questioning and then just saying your comments? Uh, thank you for the comment. As I understand it, the motion is to actually have three minute limits for board member comments during second reader just now. If I heard what you were saying, you were looking to limit the three minutes at second reader to one minute. Yeah. And uh, to be the board member's 60-second comment on a policy. Um, I hear you. I like the, redu the reduction in the time. My only concern is whether that allows a board member the opportunity to, which they feel so strongly about, to comment on the policy that's now up for second reader. Couldn't they just send an email to I board members? Email. Why don't they send an email to <laughs> I hear you. Anyway, but that's, that, that's my view, that they should just send an email and we, we allow the public to have their say at second reader. All the board members actually have time to digest then what people say. But that's just, that's just my thought. Any other comments? Yes, Kathleen. I appreciate Ms. Adekoya's comments. And sometimes when, as you say, we have limited time in the Board of Education meetings to process through the many, many issues that we do, that perhaps, um, as you had mentioned earlier, a compromise or consensus of agreement. So if I took your recommendation of one minute as opposed to three as a friendly revision to my amendment, if uh, my seconder would approve that, um, if a board member had additional comments that did not fit into one minute, they would know that they have the email as a backup. But certainly I think in many instances, especially when board members have perhaps attended uh, advisory council meetings or other community events and they've heard a lot of input around policies that they may want to at the board meeting express that they are responding to concerns or that they, that other stakeholders um, comments are being considered. Does that make sense? Would you consider that then a one minute time frame? I believe a one minute Time frame is still is still okay, and the rest can surely be emailed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll uh, I will um, revise my amendment to your motion, Steve, to be one minute rather than three. Let me just turn to staff to see if they have that. <laughs> yes, she has everything. Very good. Uh, any further discussion? Yes, Chuck. And again, I'm going to support the motion. I did not envision when I was talking about this that every board member would want to comment. I wouldn't think PRC members would find a need because we have the opportunity, we're live stream, but there are board members that aren't um, members. They, they would be the ones, and they would be the ones that would be limited to speak for a minute and then email. So that's what I would envision in practice. Well, let me just check with staff to make sure that we have the motion, that we have an amendment to the motion, and that we're first voting on the amendment to the underlying motion. Is that how staff, is that how staff sees it? Yes. All right. And the underlying motion is my motion, mm -hmm. but the vote before us now is uh, the proposed amendment to the proposed amendment uh, um, with regard to my uh, amendment. Mm -hmm. uh, and of note is whether that should now read one minute as opposed to three. So uh, I guess what I'm looking for is a second to the amendment to amend the amendment. Second. Second. Any further discussion on the um, amendment from three minutes to one minute in the amendment to my amendment? 
There being no additional discussion, all in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Very good. So now we have the amendment to the amendment to my amendment. Now, with regard to the amendment that has just been modified to my amendment, all in favor of that amendment. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? There being none. Now, for the combination amendment, my amendment as modified. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Uh, it having passed, I would ask staff to provide the policy review committee with a cleaned up copy so that we may be able to see this at our next policy review committee meeting, uh, unless there are any other amendments to policy 8130 from uh, members of our committee. There being no other amendments to it, I would ask staff to present a clean copy to the Policy Review Committee for the committee's next meeting. Is that something that's, that's doable? I hear an assent. Okay, now I note that it is 635. There are a few other uh, policies out there. Here's what I was going to suggest to the members to consider. Uh, one doesn't know what the weather will be like, um, but um, there has been school for uh, approximately two weeks or so, and I had asked folks to come and speak about um, how our food program has been going. I would ask um, uh, consent from my colleagues to skip the other agenda items and to move to this item 10 so that we can hear uh, about existing food programs and how they're going with regard to the first two weeks of school, recognizing that it is still very early and it's difficult to get data. Um, is there a motion to do that? So moved. Uh, second, any, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. And please raise your hand. Uh, opposed, nay. All right. I would now invite up our very patient food folks to come up and speak with us um, about how um, our food programs have been going. Thank you for being so patient. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for coming by. There we go. Let's see. I guess this one goes over here. One comes here. Um, if our guests could please identify themselves. Sure. Good evening. Oh, okay, okay, so, and, and you are? I'm going to wait till he finishes passing. Okay, 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 very good. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Charles Patillo, Executive Director for Business Services, and I have here with me Karen Levenstein. Uh, the chair of this committee, Mr. Verse, asked us to come before you, talk a little bit about the summer programs, and also how we secure the children's information as related to the Food and Nutrition Services Program. So we're going to have Ms. Levenstein speak for a minute, and if you have any questions, we'll answer them at the end. Very good. We gave you a very brief summary mm -hmm. on this form. But um, our summer food service program, which ran from uh, July 20th to August the 24th this school year, or this past summer, 2018, is really a federally funded program, and it's state administered. So our Maryland State Department of Education, our lead agency, oversees the operation of this. That's where we get our funding uh, for this program in the summer. And the, um, the USDA encourages school districts across the country to administer this program because it's, it's fairly underutilized. But it does provide access to children who are 18 years and younger uh, for either a breakfast and lunch program during, this, during those weeks that school is out. So for example, this past summer, uh, we began June 20th. We were in 10 Baltimore County Public Libraries. They've been a great friend and colleague and have partnered with us. We grew from four to eight to now we're up to 10. So they're located in areas where it is considered uh, economically in need. So the youngsters would come in for breakfast or lunch. In this case, at the libraries, it was lunch. And um, you don't have to announce your name, you don't have to say anything, but come in and receive a meal at the appointed time that the library determined they would have lunch. And we merely use hash marks, if you will. And at the end of the day, if there's any leftovers, we handle those appropriately back at our operating kitchens. We had four locations that prepared these meals. We served all of the Title I schools that were in session, both breakfast and lunch, all the, ex all the um, 
extended day school learning programs that were in middle and high school. We serve those as well. And then we serve various camps and churches and clubs if they qualify, if the location is 50% or greater uh, farms eligible. So for this year, I just gave you some numbers at the bottom. I didn't give you the number of sites, it just gave you total numbers. Breakfast, 100, over 116,000, and lunch is 132,000 meals during the summer. Mm. And all those locations, all the libraries are all air conditioned. They are. During the summer. And um, uh, with regard to the new school year, mm -hmm. it's just begun, mm -hmm. uh, I'd ask that and with regard to new school year, what has just begun, I've asked uh, Mr. Uh, Patella, as executive director, if he could share with me information about this um, uh, breakfast in the classroom initiative. Okay. Um, Mr. Patella, is it correct that, that we're in 80 schools with that? That's correct. Uh, as of this year, we added 14 new schools. So each year, just to give you a little bit of background, mm -hmm. we have a list that we have that we, we have for MSDE. And again, based on funding, they'll say, Okay, this, this year you can add three, this year you can add five. I think this year was an anomaly. We had more funding than we usually get. Usually we get three to seven schools, but this year we were able to get 14 for a total of 80 at this particular time. And uh, the total number of eligible students, that's uh, something on the order of close to 50,000, is that right? That's yes. correct. Now there's about a 60% participation rate or so, but still it's available. On last year. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So we extrapolated last year, we mm -hmm. got 60%, so we're assuming, because this year just started, we'll probably get at least that much. I see. And um, how has um, how, how have the other food, food programs during this two-week period gone? Very well. Uh, we've opened Honey Go Elementary. We've opened Victory Villa. We had uh, Lansdowne Elementary. So a lot of our attention was on those three schools, brand new schools, to be, ensure that they're op they were operating and up and running. Of course, we had our meeting mm -hmm. um, <laughs> with the student board member and with the school um, uh, counselors. I'm sorry, the student government president. So we met, we're going to talk about meeting with them throughout the year to talk about some of our uh, food choices and things that we offer the youngsters and really get some feedback. And I think we're going to have a really good partner in these these uh, young people this year. Well, ha having a large number of Title I schools in, in our sixth district that I represent, I'm so glad and grateful for the work that y'all do. Um, I'm excited about going forward and how we're expanding and we're meeting the needs of our kids. Uh, Victorville is a school I attended, as I tell everybody, for a year when there was no room at Hawthorne. Yeah. Um, and of course, you're in Hawthorne. Yes. So, and uh, I have a complete list of all 80 schools, so if any of you have any questions about it, Mr. Patillo can, can, uh, can let you know in more detail, but I also have a list. Um, does any of our board members have any comments they'd like to make or any questions they might have for our food service folks? Yeah, Chuck. Just uh, thank you for uh, being here. Just to explain again the uh, breakfast in classroom versus how it was previously. Do they go to the cafeteria previously to have breakfast? Or? <coughs> This is really written into the Comar law as well for the breakfast program. Breakfast is to be served in the classroom. All the components are available. The youngsters enter, go right to their classroom, and during the morning announcements, the bell time and all, they're consuming breakfast. And their teachers also are invited to join us for breakfast as well to model good eating behaviors, if you will. But the youngsters then, our staff, deliver those meals to the school uh, classrooms and then return after s the announcements and all we return those um, insulated bags that you just approved at last board meeting to um, bring those back and refill them for the next day so the idea is there was some research done a while back by a Harvard research company and years and years ago we were one of the first school systems that had breakfast in the classroom at Riverview Elementary and it was uh, funded by the Abel Foundation in later years, the governor has signed this on as a funding uh, uh, opportunity, but it goes through the Maryland State Department of Education. So we apply to those for those for those funding to MSDE. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Um, I don't have. I don't have any questions. <laughs> my survey is up though. So it's great. On my website. Oh, great. Thank you. We'll be looking for those responses. Great idea. Yeah, Kathleen. I just wanted Ms. Adekoya to explain a little bit about her survey, mm -hmm. and then I had comments for the staff. Okay, Please my, explain about your survey. <laughs> my survey is to generate feedback from students pertaining transportation and the food and nutrition services.
basically asking do they enjoy it and what could be done better, just receiving their opinions for us to move forward as a system. Okay. Any further comments? I just want to say thank you to the staff. I know that this is a very, very important resource, resource for our students. We know that <clears throat> in order to learn, it, our children need to have proper nutrition and other wellness um, available to them. So I really appreciate the work that you do. I know it was very hard with the school openings because they were working right up to the time right up while to we the were end. trying to yes. get the fresh apples in there <laughs> yes. while they're cleaning the kitchen. So yes. really appreciate all your hard work and I'm very glad to see the progress that we're making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being so patient. Uh, very much appreciate the update. And uh, should any board members have any questions they think that may come to them after the meeting, feel free to uh, pass them along. Uh, they've been very responsive to any questions that I have had. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Yay. Second. Uh, any discussion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you so much, members. Thank you. Thank you.